thankful that you're here this morning. So thankful that we can hear, <coughs> hear a word from our Lord. So uh, as we would uh, anticipate that, we can pray with you. Father, I trust that for each of us, whether literally or not, I trust that at least figuratively, we're sitting on the edge of our seats. Because never is a word from you of little or no value. And so, Father, in these moments, that's the longing of our hearts. To hear a word from you, from you, Lord Jesus, to, to through these moments and through your speaking, see you and know you a little bit clearer, a little bit better, and to draw nearer to you. Father, as you would lift up Jesus through these moments, may we be drawn to him, and may we then go forth to declare him. We pray in his name. observe uh, God's glory, what would it look like? <coughs> Have you ever seen <coughs> God's glory? The Bible has a lot to say about uh, God's glory. Last week uh, we heard Jesus declare uh, in his high priestly prayer before he uh, went to the Garden of Gethsemane, that uh, he had brought glory to the Father by completing the work that the Father had given him to do. Moses, when he went up on the mountain, it's recorded in uh, Exodus chapter 24, verse 16, that the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. King Solomon, when he uh, completed the building of the temple in Jerusalem and uh, was in the process of dedicating that temple to God, the statement is made in uh, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. But then, uh, because of the people's persistent sin, several centuries later, the prophet Ezekiel saw the glory of the Lord depart from over the temple. Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 18. The Lord himself reveals through the prophet Habakkuk that there's coming a day when the earth will be filled with the, the, the uh, uh, knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. At uh, his birth, at the birth of Jesus, a great number of heavenly beings cried out, Glory to God in the highest. Luke chapter 2. As uh, the people of God, his children are to live uh, to the praise of his glory. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 14. And in the new Jerusalem that will one day come down out of heaven from God. There won't be a sun and a moon. There won't be any need for them because the glory of God gives it light. Ephes or Revelation chapter 21, verse 23. 
But the fact is that uh, all of these uh, either took place long, long ago, or uh, they are still in the future. So the question that we start out with still remains, uh, have you seen God's glory? And if you could, what would it look like? The prophet Isaiah records that in the year that King Uzziah died, which would have been uh, 740 years before Christ, uh, he saw the Lord. He saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, high and lifted up. And he was surrounded by heavenly angelic beings calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah chapter 6. Don't miss the words that those angelic beings uh, proclaimed. They said, the whole earth is full of God's glory. So if indeed the whole earth is full of God's glory, it only seems reasonable that uh, we ought to be able to see and observe evidences of that glory. And the text for today, in that text, David declares just exactly that. He says, if a person will look for those who are attentive for those who have eyes to see, those persons can observe all kinds of glimpses of God's glory all around. Our text comes from the 19th Psalm. I'd like to read that in your hearing if you have your Bible, and I hope that you do. I really do hope that you bring your Bibles. Would you follow along? Psalm 19. The words of David. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There's no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. According to the inspired uh, psalm writer, sometimes the uh, glory of God can be seen in very public ways, literally displayed for everyone to see. So David contends the uh, glory of God is shown uh, by his created world, verses 1 through 6. 
David concentrates specifically on uh, that part of God's creation, the heavenly bodies. Uh, he says, the heavens, the skies. You can't go any place from the densest jungles of equatorial Africa to the vast frozen reaches of the Arctic or Antarctica. You can't go any place where you will escape the testimony of the heavenly bodies to God's glory. Maybe it'll be the early morning brilliance of uh, a, a, a red-orange sky in the east. Maybe it'll be the uh, cold, clear voice of literally thousands of stars on a January <laughs> night. Maybe it'll be the northern lights or the tail of a comet or uh, a hope-stirring rainbow or an unforgettable eclipse of the sun. Whatever it is, each of these heavenly events will proclaim to those who are listening will proclaim, this doesn't just happen by accident. This is the work of the hands of a glorious God. But David's focus is on one small fraction of that heavenly declaration. He says, look at the sun. And he likens that son to uh, a bridegroom or to a champion athlete. Uh, that, that athlete, as he's preparing for that uh, athletic event, he might go into a tent to uh, kind of rest and refresh. <laughs> and so uh, David uh, says that uh, this God pitches a tent if you will, the sun goes down and uh, rests, if you will, for a few hours and uh, then uh, uh, comes up again on the other side of the globe and here it comes. Morning comes and the sun comes rising and running across its circuit of the sky. <coughs> Nothing can hide from the presence of the sun's rays, the sun's heat. It penetrates every portion of the earth. There's no escaping it. Now you might question and you might say, uh, how could the, that regular activity of the sun repeated day after day, month after month, how could that uh, say anything about the glory of God? Missionary Don Richardson, uh, in his delightful book, Eternity in Their Hearts, recounts uh, the powerful ruler of the ancient Inca Empire, His name was Pachacuti, and uh, the ancient Incas uh, worshipped the sun god, whom they called Inti. They worshipped him as the supreme god. He's the source of everything. But Pachacuti was uh, an intelligent man, and he began to question this belief. He got to thinking, now wait a minute, if empty, the sun, is the supreme God, why is it that he always acts the same? He never does anything original. It's always coming up and going over and going down. He never does anything original. And also, if he's the supreme God, why is it that the smallest cloud will cover him up? And so Pachacuti 
concluded, hey, the sun can't be the supreme God. There's got to be a God bigger than the sun. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hand. Sometimes we can see God's glory from unavoidable, very public evidences like the heavens and the skies. But according to David, there are other times when God's glory uh, can be seen in quiet, even subtle statements. And so David says, uh, don't miss the glory of God that is shown by His revealed Word, verses 7 through 11. <coughs> the Word declares the glory of God because that Word is powerful and that Word is long-lasting. The Word of God, David says, can give new life it can bring refreshment. It can bring revival to the most destitute, to the most pitiful life situation. Time after time, loneliness, depression, discouragement can be dispelled by reading that psalm or maybe by reading some words of Lord Jesus from one of the Gospels. The Word does revive the soul. And that Word gives life a whole new perspective in that moment. We have a multitude of textbooks. We have a multitude of college courses, graduate level courses. We have a multitude of Oprah's and self-help sites on the internet. We have all kinds of knowledge and advice at our fingertips. But if you really want wisdom to live life to its fullest, go to the Word of God. Are you looking for true happiness, genuine joy uh, that doesn't rise or fall with every change in the commodity markets or the weather conditions? You won't find that uh, joy, you won't find that genuine happiness in a new hairstyle, in a dream vacation, or in a job promotion. If you want genuine, ongoing joy and contentment, you find it in the precepts of the Word of the Lord. You want the light of what is genuinely true, as opposed to the haze and the fog and the uncertainty of what's popular. That light, that truth is found in the radiant Word of God. What was proven, supposedly proven, fact yesterday, today it's called into question. Sue just told me the other night. Of course, I've known for years that uh, medical science says uh, Women, especially women uh, over 50, need to be sure and take plenty of calcium because uh, in order to prevent osteoporosis. Now Sue says that she heard that there are new studies that say, oh, slow down on your calcium intake, it's going to hurt your heart. You see, what's fact today, tomorrow, is shown to be not nearly so certain. Most of us have accepted, and indeed through most of human history, it's been accepted that uh, the healthy plan for a family is uh, a man and a woman together for life. And now that uh, understanding is uh, 
decided to be bigoted and narrow-minded and uh, unloving. David says you want instruction in truths that are sure, that are right, uh, that are enduring, that won't change with every political wind. You'll find those truths only in the eternal Word of God. All the gold in Fort Knox, all the world's riches will never displace, uh, uh, will never be as satisfying as the Word of God. The best meal you will ever eat at Red Lobster or the Golden Corral will never satisfy you to the extent that the Word of God will. For those uh, clinging to and uh, living according to the Word of God, it carries with it, David says, its own reward. There is nothing like the Word of God. That Word that declares, that evidences the glory of God. David contends that not just do the heavens declare the glory of God, not just does the Word of God declare the glory of God, but there's uh, one final way that we can see God's glory, and that's through changed and transformed lives, verses 12 and 13. David has just stated that when one aligns himself, his life, with the Word of God, the results are noticeable and significant. The benefits to life are termed great reward. But the truth is, whether it's the psalmist David, or whether it's me, or whether it's you, every one of us has an uncanny way of ignoring, of overlooking, of rationalizing our sins and faults, our behaviors. Sometimes we uh, close our eyes and we don't really realize uh, our sin. I'm not prejudiced. I'm not prejudiced, but then uh, a family of another race moves in next door or across the road, and I find myself not associating with them simply because their skin color is different and their customs are different. Sometimes, uh, we know very well right from wrong, but we uh, decide we're just going to do it or not do it anyway. I know I shouldn't spread that rumor and gossip, but it's just too good. It's just too juicy to keep to myself. David says the Word of God reveals those <coughs> hidden things, and the Word of God can keep us from willful sins. God's glory is displayed whenever David, whenever you, whenever I depart a life of hidden sin or outright rebellion and rejection of God. And when we determine to live a life that's in a blameless manner, not ruled over by sin, but rather innocent of great transgression. But it's at this point that David's psalm leaves us without an answer. Because simply having my sin pointed out, simply having your sin pointed out, uh, even uh, deciding that we're not going to sin anymore doesn't provide the power 
to follow through and to live victoriously over sin. And certainly just those decisions don't erase the sin, the failure that's already permeated the lives of every one of us. Certainly just those decisions don't qualify us to be blameless. And yet David says that's possible. What David could only hope for, you and I, indeed every single individual, now have opportunity to embrace. Because the one whose birth was declared to display the glory of God, the one who came to earth with glory, Indeed, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth, John 1, verse 14. The, the one who brought glory to God by being lifted up on a cross, John chapter 12. Jesus Christ, through his sin-bearing death and through his victorious resurrection provides cleansing from sin so that every person can be judged innocent, can be declared blameless before God. And as if that's not marvelous enough, Jesus Christ provi provides strength and power to live a genuinely transformed life a life in which sin no longer rules over one's life. You say, really? Is that really, really for real? Just a couple of days ago, the uh, monthly newsletter came from the Bicross in Sri Lanka. Arul and Komati and their family were dist our distant cousins from Shanti Bycroft. Arul, the husband, is a Catholic. Komati, the mother, is a Hindu. But over the last several years, uh, the gospel has been... Uh, declared to them, has been explained to them, and four of their five children are now Christians. But Komati, the mother, has clung tenaciously to her Hindu beliefs. She struggled for uh, several years with health issues. Recently, those health issues uh, got uh, pretty extreme. In fact, she spent several days in the hospital. Her leg got so swollen and painful that she couldn't even walk on it. She had uh, <coughs> been presented with the facts of the gospel in the past, but she uh, ignored them. But now, because of her swollen leg and her extreme health issues, she... Uh, invited uh, Shanti's niece to come, who's a Christian, and uh, pray for her. The niece told her, said, it's not going to do any good to pray for you because you can't come under God's protection as long as you cling to your Hindu beliefs. Her condition was desperate enough. She agreed to uh, turn from those Hindu beliefs. The niece prayed for her. Komati took those symbols that every Hindu uh, uh, woman wears, a little thread tied around the wrist, a string tied around the upper arm, a uh, pendant, a tiny pendant hung from a necklace strap. She cut that string on her wrist. She cut that string on her upper arm. She took off the necklace. 
they were burned. The niece went into Komati's house and took down all of the pictures off of the little Hindu prayer room in the center of the house and burned them. The next day, uh, and the niece prayed for Komati. The next day, the swelling on Komati's leg was down significantly. The second day, she went and visited Steve and Shanti completely well. This past Sunday, the whole family was in church as a family. As if that wasn't astounding enough, they went to the market that Sunday afternoon and bought beef. That was the first time in her life that Komati had ever tasted beef. As a Hindu, she would not taste beef. They bought beef, and that was during a Hindu religious festival when all Hindus were supposed to be strict vegetarians. Is it possible that the Word of God in a transformed life could really bring glory to God? You'd never convince Stephen Shanti that that isn't the case when they look at the life of Komadi. But is your life, is my life, displaying, showing forth, bringing glory to God. Two things are absolutely essential for that to be the case. The first is that a person must be cleansed, <coughs> forgiven, uh, sins washed away by the shed blood of Jesus. That only happens through a decision of the will to put your faith and trust in Jesus to repent of sin, to confess His name, and to be immersed, baptized into Him. But the second thing that's essential for a life to uh, display the glory of God is that uh, that life would be lived in the power of Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. To do that, on a daily basis, I find it helpful, and you might find it helpful, to make the words of David your own. You might find it helpful to use his words as a daily prayer. Maybe it would be helpful to live that life... Uh, that victorious life over the power of sin, it might be helpful to uh, pray these words that David closes the psalm with. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. May that be the case this day. He is the King of glory, Psalm 24, verse 10. He is the Lord of glory, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8. But are you, are you seeing God's glory declared in creation? Are you uh, experiencing God's glory and the power of His Word? And are you displaying God's glory through living a transformed life? May you and may I make that prayer our own. Would you pray with me? Father, we want to uh, live in such a way that it would be for the praise of your glory. And so, uh, as we would pursue that, Father, may it be for each of us that the words of David are our words. May the 
the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord. My rock and my Redeemer. In the name of our Redeemer, Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you have uh, never been cleansed, been forgiven, why not today? Why not today decide to follow Jesus? That's our hymn of decision, number 376, I have decided to follow Jesus. If uh, you need to uh, make some kind of a public decision, maybe your decision, maybe, maybe God's dealing with your heart that you just need to make that prayer of David your own. Maybe that doesn't necessitate anything public kind of a decision. But if God's dealing with your heart on some kind of a public way, maybe to commit your life to Christ, maybe to unite your life with this church family in a very uh, committed way, uh, something else, if he's dealing with you, would you uh, respond as we stand and sing number 376? <laughs>